from Union Square in downtown San Francisco. It's the Cube covering PagerDuty Summit 18. Now here's Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're at PagerDuty Summit at the Western St. Francis in Union Square, San Francisco. About a thousand people getting together, talking about the evolution of PagerDuty. We're really excited to have Jennifer Tejada here, the CEO, just coming off a terrific keynote. And I got to say, congratulations on your recent round of funding that made all the news a week ago. It's great to see you. Thank you very much. It's great to see you again, as always, Jeff. We love having the Cube with us at Summit. Thank you. And I have to say, we do hundreds of events over over six years. I've been doing this. I've never seen a summit picture in the keynote until the summit. So you got it worked in twice. I love the message really about taking the team to the top of the mountain, that moment of truth, and then you got to just go for it. You got to be prepared, you got to have the team, and at some point in time, you just got to go. It was Point awesome. them down. Yeah, so let's jump into it. So big topic um, here before has been kind of DevOps, and but you guys are moving beyond that. You're kind of taking this classic play, start as an application, move into a platform space, and you guys now with all these integration announcements, the announcements of BI, the growth obviously, the support from the funding that you just got shows that you guys are well on your way to take what was a pretty special purpose application and take it into a platform play that crosses a whole bunch of other applications. Yeah, I'd take it even one step further. We almost started out more like a consumer app. I mean, it was really an application built for engineers to make better use of their time on call and frankly not being woken up when they didn't need to be, right? right, right. And so everything about our first product was designed around what does a developer need, what does an ops person need, what does that look like, et cetera, as opposed to being designed for the CIO or the CTO or the company, right, 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 and I think that that user centricity, that user ethos, has served us really well, because we start there. That's our starting point. Who's the community that is using our products and services? How is their role changing? How's their world changing? And what do they need from us? And that was really the foundation of the trust that we built to start to become truly an ecosystem. Because all those users started pushing their data to us. They're monitoring data from their APM environments or the data from their ticketing platforms or the data from their cloud services. And with that information comes the power to be able to really create context. Right, right. And, and you know, now with the aggregation of nearly 10 years of data coming from our responders and how they behave when they're under pressure, the workflows, which ones work better, which ones don't work so well, and the events, the signals that all of technology and the internet of things throws off in real time all the time, you bring that data together and apply machine learning and artificial intelligence to it, and we really are putting ourselves in a position not only to be the platform that serves a real-time business right. and orchestrates teams as sort of the platform for action, but importantly becomes the trusted you know, engagement for automation or engagement of autonomy right. for, for a, a high, fast moving business in the future. Right, because you talked about real time, and I just want to throw a couple numbers out that you had from the keynote, 3.6 billion events. So it, it becomes apparent really fast. So far this year. Right, even though people are <laughs> at the center of that, that's kind of hard to manage. So you have to start to use the intelligence, you have to start to use business intelligence and artificial intelligence yeah. to help filter and help that person do their job much better. So totally. you guys are making a lot of plays there, and, and we see it all the time. It's not the BI vendors per se, it's the use of this technology in the background to make apps work better. And it's the fact that not only do we correlate the signals and turn them into intelligent insights, but we can then route those signals intelligently to the right people and orchestrate the actual physical work. So, you know, a lot of the technology community has been focused on just that, technology, and our focus is really on people and teams. How do you empower teams closest to the action, closest to where the proverbial stuff hits the fan, right, right. and to really exercise restraint there, um, to be in a position to make the best possible decision in those tiny micro moments that matter. And you know, the consumer, like you used, used to wait maybe six minutes for a website to download. Now, if an app doesn't work perfectly in six seconds, maybe three seconds, you're gone. I, I walk out of the building in our office in San Francisco and see our employees and they're toggling back and forth between ride sharing apps and food delivery apps and Tinder and you know whatever else is going on. And it's literally like in a couple of minutes, they're, they're, they're working through eight, nine applications at once. And if any one of those does not work the way it's supposed to, they're done. Right. They right. just move on. And it's you know one or two times before they'll delete that. Right. So uh, you know the technology community is now 
um, responsible for delivering the perfect brand experience digitally every time. And they've got to be empowered to do that right. with the right tools and services. And the expectation is set by the best. I mean, that's that's the funny oh, thing, yeah. right? What what was the best or cutting edge quickly becomes the expected What is norm. the most delightful thing that ever happened to me? Well, that's what I want from you. Right. I mean, that is basically the way right, it works. Right. And you talked about trust, and, and trust is such an important part because one of the key pieces that you guys are enabling, you talked about in your keynote, is, is letting the person at the front line in that moment of decision have the tools and the data and the authority to make the right call. And it's not a escalation up the food chain, wait, send some emails. It's really empowering that individual to get the right thing done. And that's a core tenant of DevOps culture. It, you know, it's actually born and agile, in fact. But what's really interesting about it is it's the way companies need to be run now. If, if pager duty waited for me to make every big decision, we would be back where we were three years ago. Right. Right. And as a result of being able to empower our teams with great information, very clear understanding of our goals and the timeframes that we expect to achieve those goals, and then context as we progress through our journey to understand how we're doing against those goals, it gives them the power and the intelligence to make better decisions every moment when I obviously can't be there or their leadership can't be there. And in fact, it means that the most important decisions are getting made where the person's closest to our end customer, the user. Right. And that, I, th that makes a ton of sense to me, even if it's not the way I, I was taught leadership right. or taught to manage. Right. Well, you clearly get out front and run those people down that big giant mountain. So I, well, I just, <laughs> every you know, time with me, I learned I gotta something. Figure you know, it I learned out, about man. Australia last time <laughs> I saw you speak at, at the Girls in Tech thing. So this is great. Um, another thing that you acknowledge in, in, in your keynote I wanted to get into is that tech and people are imperfect. Yeah. Right. They're, they are imperfect, and that's kind of part of what the DevOps ethos is. Is that that's okay. We're just going to make it better today than it was yesterday. And I think Ray Kurzweiler's uh, keynote about you know, exponential growth and just the power of compounding, which so many people miss out on. So that's really where you're trying to help people solve problems. It isn't the totally. big eureka moment, it's how do we learn, how do we get better, how do we make improvements? Well, and a lot of people in the Valley talk about you know, failing fast. In order for failing fast to have a benefit for a company, you not only have to be allowed to fail, it has to be okay when you fail, and there has to be an open, transparent conversation about what you learned, what went wrong, and that has to be a blameless, high empathy discussion, or it doesn't work. If someone thinks they're going to get fired by marching you through all the details of their failure, they're never going to tell you the truth. So when we think about incidences they come up or something breaking, not working the way it's supposed to, or a business initiative not you know, turning out the way we thought it would, there has to be a blameless conversation so that everybody in that community learns so that we're better the next time around. And that's where the compounding benefits come. Right, right. To the whole team effect, I thought the quote, I've never seen that quote that you brought up uh, today. Teamwork remains the ultimate competitive advantage because it's both so powerful and so rare. Yeah. I mean, that is a really scary statement, but we see it all the time. In fact, I was at another keynote and there was a, a behaviorist talking about how do we get everybody pulling in the same direction? And John uh, Oswald talked about that in terms of, of incident postmortems and how do you make sure that you're learning and not just filing reports. Totally. So you guys are right in the middle of that. I, I thought John captured it really well when he said, it's not about the technology. We spend all of our time monitoring and talking about the technology. It's about us. And it's us that actually makes this technology great and applies it so effectively to problems and challenges and opportunities in our world and in our lives. But what is also interesting is Patrick, yep. <laughs> Patrick Lenz, what's also interesting is Patrick Lencioni's um, uh, paradigm around the first team. So most employees come into a business and they think the most important world for me in this company is my team, the people in the team who I report to, you know, a, a leader and it's just us. Or right. for leaders, they say it's just the team that reports into me. Your first team is your peer group. Your first team is that, and by first team I mean the most important, highest priority, aligned organism that is going to drive massive change in a business. It's your peer group. It's the people who work across functions to help reduce friction in a business right. and drive fast outcomes and great results, right? But most people naturally kind of hunker down into their core team and that's the beginning of the silo mentality, right? right? And so one of the things I love about Patrick's book, and you're going to hear about that tomorrow on stage, is this idea of what it takes to be an ideal team player, to be humble, to be hungry, like good is never good enough, and to be um, smart, to like constantly be learning, to really care deeply about 
how, how you continue to push the envelope to get better. Right. So I want to switch gears a little bit from the people and the individual teams to the ecosystem, right? You got a ton of partners here at the, uh, at the show, and you talked about in the keynote 300 integrations. Yeah. Um, and I think some people might be confused, right? Because it's always this wrestle for whose screen am I working on when I'm doing my daily yeah. job. But as you said, we're in a lot of different screens, right? I'm going back from Salesforce. I'm in my G Suite. I'm, maybe I'm jumping into to Hootsuite for some social stuff. You guys have basically embraced the ecosystem for all these different totally. types of systems and really kind of plugged into that. So I wonder if you can explain a little bit more because I'm, I'm sure most people might be confused by that. You know, I sort of think of us in the same way I would think of like the brain of an Olympic athlete, right? That athlete, like their arms, their legs, their muscles, their pulmonary capability, like their respiratory system is all super important to their performance. But the brain has to accept the signals from all the different parts of the body and then work through them, correlate them, and then drive action, right? And I sort of think of PagerDuty as sitting at the center of this you know, rapidly changing technology ecosystem, this live organism, and really understanding the signals no matter what, the, is it raining? Is, is there a pothole in the ground, you know, et cetera? And being able to then drive change in the process on the fly to help the body perform more effectively. Right. And you know, the, the challenge is like, if you try and fight with the arms and the legs and every other part of the body, they don't work nicely with you. Right. So being central to the ecosystem is about being neutral and agnostic and really demonstrating you will not only uh, say you will partner, but investing in those right. partnerships. So we build first class integrations to companies that may see us as competition if that's what our comp is that, if that's what our customers need. Right, because like you said, it's got to be customer totally. customer centric first. And it's um, an open ecosystem, and this is what developers and you know employees and tech workers expect. Right, and to your point, the amount of data that's flowing through that nervous system is only getting more, and the amount of noise to to get through Figure to the signal to take really the right is action is is not getting. Getting any easier, right? Yeah. <laughs> totally. All right, Jennifer. Well, thanks again for, for uh, having us. Congratulations uh, on the funding and the great show, and it's always great to Thank catch you. up. Thank you. I have the best job in the world. I feel very lucky. <laughs> All right. It's great to see you, Jeff. Thank you. All right, she's Jennifer Todd. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We're at PagerDuty Summit, where they actually show summits on the keynote <laughs> screen. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.